<laughs> is is the showing? The... Oh, record. Okay, Mo has already so, done it. Thanks, Mo. Okay, so I, I also yeah. I also started. Okay, uh, Mo started recording. Thank you, thank okay, you, Mo. Thanks, so may, may I know any request uh, the pre, uh, presenters to introduce themselves and then go for the presentation. So yeah, thank you for yeah. Uh, can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, thank you yeah, for the introductions. Uh, let me share my slides and then I will start my presentation immediately. Huh? Okay. okay. So mm, do you see my slides? Yeah. Okay, yes, good. Yes, uh, good. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Lam. Um, I'm a visiting researcher from the Alliance of Biodiversity Bio International and CS. And thank you for having me today. Uh, today I'm going to be sharing a recent study on applying human central designs to examine right farmers' access to and use of climate information and advisories in the Mekong River Delta, Vietnam. I have conducted this study together with uh, Dr. Diana Hilado Mendes from the Alliance Climate Action Teams in Central America, and also with the support from the Climate Action Team here in Vietnam, including Lady uh, James Jais and Dr. K. Swans. And um, please note that the study is ongoing. I have just finished the data collection one month ago, and I'm now analyzing the data. So today I will focus more on the, met on the methodologies and sharing some initial results. Let me start by giving you some background information. Uh, uh, first, let me introduce the agroclimatic bulletins or ACB in short. So um, the ACB is the climate service that the Alliance has been developed together with a government partner of Vietnam since 2020. Uh, it provides seasonal 10-day forecast and monthly forecast and advisories to rice farmer in the Mekong River Delta. And uh, it provides climate weather forecast as well as tailor advisories uh, per district. And um, to it, um, it's the bulletins are developed by provincial technical working groups of over 170 government staff in all 13 provinces in the Mekong River Delta, of Vietnam, and to ensure the wider reach, the bulletins has been disseminated through multiple channels including Zalo, which is like um, a WhatsApp-like messaging app in Vietnam, uh, through public loudspeaker systems, printed poster, meetings, trainings, and cooperative sharings, and um, local authorities. So um, this, as you can see on the slide, this is how it's uh, the ACB loops on mobile phones. So it is being shared through Zalo group chat with different uh, image cards like weather forecast advisories on fertilizer use, on water management, or on pest and disease management. Um, despite some positive feedback that we have received through surveys or um, review meeting with our partners, we lacked clarity on who uses the, the service and, and how they actually use the ACB, the service that we are providing. Therefore, we conducted this qualitative study based on human central design approach to observe the uh, users, the farmer, interview them to understand their motivation, attitudes, and behavior when using climate services. Um, so let me introduce the um, human central designs. So according to IDEO, which is a well-known designs and consulting firm, human central designs is a creative, interactive problem-solving approach that aims to create solutions to improve people's lives. And it focuses on inclusivity, a designing solution to fit the context in which the users use the service and suits the user, suit the user's needs and easy to use. 
And moreover, um, there has been an increasing call for the application of human central design or design thinking in climate service development and implementations uh, to ensure the services meet the needs of the target users and also to make sure the to ensure the sustainability of these services. Um, now let me give you um, how to say walk you through the human central design process process, which involves five stages. And you can see on the slide, um, it starts first. It starts with a scope phase in which we define the problem we want to address by answering some questions like who is affected by the problem, what are the problems, where, when, why it occurs, why it happens. And uh, next in the explore phase, we talk to the users, to the people affected by the problem to understand their context, their experiences, their struggles and their needs. Then um, in the create phase, based on the insight we obtain from the explore phase, we come up with different ideas or solution to solve the problem. We build prototypes of those um, ideas or solutions following that in the validate phase, we test these prototypes with the real users, with the user to see uh, what works and what doesn't, and also ask for their feedback. And uh, finally, in the implement stage, we put these, um, uh, we put the best idea into practice. We adapt and scale them in different uh, contexts. And um, it is important to note that um, even though this process looks like a linear process, but actually it's a continuous learning process, it's, a, it's iterative. So that's why for the study that I'm going to present today, we uh, focus on two stages. On one hand, we want to validate the current agroclimatic bulletins or ACB in short with the user, with the rice farmer. On the other hand, we revisited the explore phase to understand their needs for climate services and the context in which they access climate information and make use of these informations. Um, so why? Why do we want to apply human central designs? It is because we believe that this approach offers some advantages uh, compared to other methods or approaches. Um, first, we think that human central design provides us with guidelines on how to immerse into the user's world. And by doing so, we can develop a deeper empathy for the user, for the farmer, understand their challenges and their needs uh, firsthand. Secondly, human central design focus on observations of users' behavior, and by observing how farmers actually use the ACB, the agroclimatic bulletins, we can gain valuable insights into their behaviors. Thirdly, uh, the human central design approach emphasizes um, the use of some in advanced interview techniques like show me, tell me, asking five wise, having two people conducting interviews with one being the main interviewer and the other being the note taker or observers. And lastly, by observing the users in practice, we believe that we can identify area for improvement in our climate service, the ACB. Um, now let me uh, give you some, let me share with you the study designs. Um, so this is a snapshot of the study. So our study has three objectives. First, we aim to identify the current sources of climate information and advisories available to rice farmers in the Mekong River Delta. Secondly, we wanted to understand how rice farmers experience, oh sorry, experience the the ACB. And finally, we want to identify, oh, there's something wrong, right? Oh, so let me change. Okay, so, and secondly, we want to identify how um, 
to, to examine how rice farmers experience the agroclimatic bulletins, the ACB. And to achieve this objective, we conducted usability tests and map out um, their user journeys to see the whole process of how farmers interact with the ACBs. And finally, we wanted to identify different user group of the ACBs based on their needs and, and preferences. And this involves using uh, user persona, and uh, I will share with you some user persona later on. And this, we conducted this study in Hotang and Sopchong provinces, and we use um, purposive sampling, selecting farmers based on their gender, age, and level of engagement with the ACBs. And uh, the data collection process took place from February to May 2024. So this is the um, data collection process. So as you can see on the slide, in total, uh, we conducted eight focus group discussion. And the purpose of this um, FGD was to obtain an overview of different sources of information that rice farmers use. And after that, I selected a participant from those FGDs to conduct in-depth interview with each um, farmers. And um, I conducted two rounds of interview. For the first round of interview, I did 52 interviews. And the purpose of the first round was to understand each interview as a whole person, understand that what they value, what are their needs, design, aspiration, and how they, or how they spend their time, and also understand the context in which they access agricultural information. After two or three weeks, I came back to the same participant and did the second round of the interview. And uh, for the second round of the interview, I zoomed in the... Sorry, I, I hear some background noise. Can, can some of you turn off their mic? Okay, good. Thank you. So for the second round of the interview, I zoomed in the uh, interviewing experience with the ACB, with the agroclimatic bulletins by conducting usability tests and also collected feedback on their um, on the on, on the ACBs and also develop their user journey. Um, so what we have um, found out so far, um, as I mentioned um, earlier, the so this study focuses on the explore and validate phase of the human central designs. And in explore phase, our aim was to understand the context in which farmer access and use climate information and advisories and also understand the users. So um, in terms of uh, context, um, what we have find, found out so far um, first is that um, this context is characterized by the lack of resources and facilities, and this may limit the farmers' abilities or capa um, capacity to act upon their information or advice advisory they receive. For example, one um, maybe one year old uh, female farmer from Hauzhang province mentioned that the advisory says we should check salinity level before watering the crops, but we don't have salinity meter to, to measure. And um, another finding is that um, uh, farmer use a mix of uh, both digital and non-digital sources of information. And there's, there is also um, an hybrid, a hybrid approach. For example, a lot of farmers watch TV programs on YouTube. And I also see that the government, uh, the Vietnamese uh, government, has actively used Zalo, um, similar to WhatsApp, to disseminate information at different uh, level. Another finding is that even though not all farmers I interview had smartphone, but they can access um, internet to their TV at home. So there is high internet coverage in the regions. And um, we we also found out that uh, that local authorities and government directives heavily influence uh, farming activities of rice farmers, such as planting schedule, water management, and because of this, um, you know, sometimes farmer. Uh, become less active in seeking additional information or advisories. 
Um, when it comes to um, different sources of agricultural information that rice farmers use, there are two key points that I would like to share. First is about the decision-making dynamics of rice farmer and how it changes throughout the seasons. So as you um, can see here, um, at the beginning and end of the seasons, rice farmer often make collective decisions. This includes planting time, crop varieties, and sale prices. And however, during the seasons, they make more independent decisions regarding fertilizer use, pest and disease management. Focus on second point. The second point that I would like to share is about the source of agricultural information that rice farmers use and how the roles of these sources vary throughout the seasons. So, um, for example, on the slide here, I put different images representing uh, different sources of agricultural uh, information for rice farmer. And I put those images in the orders of importance from left to right, top to bottom. So as you can see, at the start of the seasons, the local authority and extension officers play a very important role in farmer decision making. So um, one of the rice farmer that I interviewed told me that they waited for the advisories provided by the local authorities regarding planting windows. So two to four weeks before the start of the seasons, they attend a meeting with extension officers, with the village heads and irrigation service provider and other farmers. And in this meeting, they discuss and agree with each other on specific planting times, crop varieties and irrigation schedule for the whole seasons. And um, when it's um, during the seasons, most farmers rely on their own experience and exchange information with other farmers. And they often uh, refer to those sources as the most important sources of information. They sometimes attending um, attend workshops organized by input companies in collaboration with input shops where they learned about new fertilizers pesticides and how to apply them um, and occasionally they search the internet for crop management advisories and sometimes come across um, general advisories on tv the extension officers um, during the season they mainly provide advice or plays a role when there's an, uh, how to say, when uh, some serious issues happen like pest and disease outbreaks. When it's come to the end of the season, farmer rely more on dealers and other farmers for, for price information. But sometimes they, they also check prices on the internet and TV to, to negotiate with the dealers and discuss with other farmers who agrees on the price uh, to sell their their rice. Mm, okay, so that is about the context. When it's come to farmers' um, information seeking behaviors, we have found out some key um, insights. First, first of all, it's about how farmer information needs uh, vary throughout the season. Sometimes they actively seek some specific information at some moment. For example, they search for weather forecasts, normally three days weather forecast before planting. They search for price information before harvesting, like two weeks before harvesting. Um, however, sometimes they come across or they encounter some climate information advisories passively in online environments, such as they, they see where the forecast video automatically appear appearing on YouTube when they visit um, YouTube, or they may come across advertisement from input companies appearing on their Facebook news feed. Um, thirdly, um, farmers, um, most of the rice farmer relies on their peer farming experience for farming decision making, but they also search for online advisories, especially when they face new issues or when they lack experience. In a day, um, rice, the farmer often use their mobile phone or access internet at noon or uh, after coming back from the field or in the late afternoon or evening before and after dinners. Um, Lastly, uh, we also found out that farmers do not um, have the habit of uh, seeking long-term forecasts. 
most of them watch or follow three days or tomorrow tomorrow's weather forecast. They are concerned in, um, they are concerned about the accuracy of the long term forecast and often do not know how to interpret and don't know what to do with the information that they, they receive. So that is about um, the context. In terms of uh, farmer needs and preferences for climate information and advisories, uh, we use uh, personas to synthesize the farmer needs and preferences. So um, a persona is like a fictional profile of key user groups based on their attitude, needs, goals, and, and uh, pain points or difficulties or challenges. So it's like, um, how to say, it's, um, it's like a re representation of different user segments. So, um, and it's the, it is built based on actual uh, data, based, based on actual interviewees. And this is my process, my process to create uh, the personas. So step one, I have some uh, sampling uh, criteria, including age, gender, and in engagement with the ACBs. After that, I use the data that I collected from the second round of the interview to build their profiles based on their um, demographic source of agricultural information, their pain points or difficulties, their needs and preferences for agricultural information, digital readiness, and also their decision making. Um, and after that, I categorize them based on uh, my interview notes and also based on my interview transcript, I quote the data and categorize the data into some themes that I mentioned in step two. And finally, I look for patterns. I look for interviews that had um, a major overlap with other interviewees in some of the um, key teams. So um, let me give, yep. Yeah. You know, uh, you have five minutes more. Can you please okay. give like, the five minutes? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is an overview of the male user personas. So you can see here, uh, they are, um, they differ. They differ in terms of how they access information, how they use digital advisories, and also in their need for for climate information and advisory services. And uh, for the male um, farmers, I have identified four personas. One is innovative farmer. The other is practical farmer, the traditional farmer, and the tech savvy farmer. Let me um, show you example of one persona. So this is a persona for the innovative farmers, which includes some elements like demographic information, some testimony, some calls to uh, represent their needs and preferences, the, their challenges, the pain points or challenges in accessing information, their needs for information, their digital readiness, I also include some information on the channel that they often use to access information, their decision making um, roles, and also their engagement with the uh, agroclimatic bulletins. And due to the time constraint, I will uh, skip the other personas. So, similar to the male farmers, for the female farmers, I have also identified four um, female user personas. And um, in addition to the personas, I also we also build the user journey. So it's like um, how we say um, a map of how of different actions or different steps that farmer take when they interact with the service. So for example, this is the user journey for the innovative innovative male farmers. This user journey tells us how the innovative farmer first knew about the ACB, so is the discovery stage, how they first access to the ACBs on Zalo, and how they use, how they normally use the ACB, whether the ACB has any impact on their farming activities or whether the farmer provides any feedback on the service. And when we look at the user journey, we can also see um, the, how the farmers interact with the ACBs 
to different touch point or interaction points. Like uh, mostly they um, they use um, ACB Zalo groups or relies on extension officers at the main touch point with the service. So um, what are the implications? What are the insights? So based on the insight that we have obtained to our study, we have um, draw some indication for improvement of the ACBs and also for you know the application of human centered design approach. In terms of uh, suggestion on how to improve the ACB, we uh, firstly we think that it's important to um, provide some complementary advisories based on the needs of the farmer, especially during high risk periods, because currently we mainly provide uh, the ACB every 10 days and which may not align with farmer specific needs during high risk period. Um, based on farmer information seeking behavior, we also think that it's important to proactively engage with farmers on some social media platform where they are active, like Facebook or YouTube. And um, next, um, the personas tell us that uh, farmers have different needs and preferences for climate information and advisories. That's why it's important for us to adapt our contents and dissemination channels to meet the needs of the target user of different users of different user personas. And also by looking at the user journeys of different uh, users, we clear clearly see that there's a lack of touch points or interaction point between the farmers and the service. And also there is a lack of feedback mechanisms. So in the future, we think it's important to create more touch points. So not just rely on extension officers sharing the bulletin um, on Zalo, um, is, is it also crucial to train and support extension officers, helping them to become more interactive and responsive uh, to farmers' needs and demands? And also, it's important to develop a new feedback mechanism that is more personalized and allow farmers to ask questions and provide feedback. Um, based on our usability test, based on our observation of how farmers actually interact access to the ACBs, the agroclimatic bulletins. There are some suggestions like we think it's important to increase the salience or the visual brand identity of the agroclimatic bulletins to raise more awareness of the service and make them more stand out. It's also important to provide more interactive and engaging contents because currently we are just providing image-based uh, bulletins, which can be somehow pouring to the young um, and young farmer with high disease or readiness who prefer more interactive information. And uh, let me conclude by uh, sharing uh, my personal reflections um, based on the study results and also based on my experiences of conducting this study. Uh, firstly, as you may remember, the ACB is the climate service, which is co-developed together with government partners in Vietnam. So this approach has uh, some pros and, and cons. So um, on, on, on one hand, this approach can increase the trust in the service. However, um, it's also important to diversify the delivery channels to ensure the services like the ACP can reach different types of farmer, especially the small scale and less community engaged farmer who tend to have less connection with the local authorities or extension officers. Secondly, um, um, we think that human central design is a systematic approach that uh, have us gather information, generate um, practical insight to improve services and products uh, like the climate service. And finally, um, the human central design, which includes the use of user interview, observation of users' real interaction with the service, can have gain deeper insights into the user behavior and, and context, context, and which is like um, which can complement other methods like surveys, because for survey, oftentimes uh, we we can generate strong quantitative data, but we 
don't understand how people behave in a certain way, what are the underlying reasons for certain behavior, how people actually interact with services in specific contexts. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for the attention and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Lem, for the presentation. Now the floor is open. If any question, please raise your hands and ask a question. Yeah. Barley, can you? Hi. Yeah. Hi, I'm Angelica. Hi. Um, thanks, Lem. Thank you so much for for a very nice presentation and it's nice to see how much the ACB process have improved and the innovations that was done. So I, I used to be part of the um, AMD and in I used to be in Vietnam. So I, might, I, I had originally initially three questions, but you answered um, the two questions. So the only question I have is since the ACB, the agroclimatic bulletin is already institutionalized within MARD um, DCP, are you planning to communicate the findings um, of this research and propose enhancement in the development and the delivery process of the bulletin to DCP? And also, do you anticipate any implications in terms of um, resource allocation from DCP? Yeah, it's just more of how do you communicate these findings to MARD and also propose enhancement on the process? Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Laika. Should I address the Laika question or should I wait for more questions? I, I think uh, yeah, you can answer the question. Uh, yes, yeah, so we think, yeah, after this study, we think it's important to communicate the insights uh, study result with our partners, because in order to really apply human-centered design, it's not just um, about, you know, we applying this approach on our own, but it's also important to raise partners' awareness of this approach and uh, communicate with them and uh, to take um, actions based on the insights from the study. Because um, for the AC, for the agroclimatic bulletins, we don't you know, disseminate or create the service on our own. We work in collaboration with our partners, these are the Department of Crop Protections in Vietnam. And uh, if we continue to work with them and choose them as the key partners, then uh, I think, yes, of course, it's important to, to raise their awareness of this approach and even to train them to become um, a human central design expert, lo a local human central design um, expert. I hope that I address the question. Do you have, um... Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Deepa, I saw you raised your hand. Can you please ask the question, Deepa? Thank you so much. Rulam, um, um, thanks again for a very, very interesting presentation. I really liked um, what you've yeah. done. Great work. Um, I had a question. Um, you know, in the human centered design, um, you talk about the types of farmers applying the human centered design has allowed you to understand the user, their needs, their perspective so much better. Um, I was wondering if, you know, the digital gender gap or inequality was something that you considered because that is identified increasingly to be a key challenge. And um, the digital innovations um, initiative in the CGIR has done considerable work on, um, you know, looking more more in depth into uh, these issues, and also has developed what is um, a, a tool and a mechanism uh, called the multi-dimensional inclusivity index. Um, I I already see you've shared this. Um, overview, but I also wanted to tell you that um, it would be very nice to overlap your work with the MDII work, and we are already doing that with Work Package 3 in, in Bangladesh. But thanks a lot for your presentation. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing some information about the um, the gender gaps in, in digital services and also about the, um, you mentioned about the multidimensional uh, inclusivity index, right? And uh, yes, I, I think the focus of human centered design is to come up with solutions that are inclusive. So it doesn't have to be a advanced or complex um, solutions, but it should be something that easy to use, fit the context and the users and make sure that um, we can reach different users groups. So yes, uh, I think for our future um, step, next steps, it's also important that uh, if we make any improvement on the ACB, it's, we should take into account the different needs and, and preferences of different users, different persona, both uh, male and female users' personas to make sure that our next, our improvements of the ACB can um, reach the one who have uh, less access to information. Um, and that's why it's important to, to diversify more channels, I, I would say. So not just currently relies on the agro, um, on the extension officers to disseminate the, the bulletins, the, the service. And um, yes, I'm happy to look for more information on the uh, multidimensional inclusivity index that you have mentioned to see how I can complement or add more uh, depth to my current work, my current research. Yeah. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, I think Mariana is next and then uh, Christian. Hello, Mariana, you are muted. Then Christian, can you please ask the question because probably Mariana. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I see uh, uh, two uh, hands raised. One is Mariana, another one is Christian. So um, uh, Mariana can go first. Uh, but if you're not, if you have any problem with internet, then Christian can also ask the question. Hello, Mariana. So, yeah, uh, I think Mariana uh, shared a message uh, that there is a problem in the techniques. Okay, Rezos uh, highlighted diverse needs and preferences. Oh, okay, that was actually my question. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, Chris, Christian, can you please ask the, uh, your question to, to them? Hi. Yeah, <clears throat> pardon me. Thanks very much. Really interesting talk. I'm working on a, a sort of a overlapping project in the in Hoxiang and Soptrang also. So there's a lot of um, sort of overlap in what's going on, which is really interesting. Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, I've got a few questions, but two two when you were in Soptrang, did you have much uh, interaction with Khmer, so ethnic minority Khmer um, farmers, and how do they sort of fit into the persona sort of thing? Are they do they sort of fit in nicely with kin, ethnic kin? Um, so the so yeah, what what did you sort of think about that Khmer ethnic minority? The second question, sort of not really one you could maybe answer easily, but I, I, how does this human-centred design differ from other other things like participatory action research and just, I suppose, inclusive research? Um, like, what? yeah, how's that different? Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Paul, for the questions. So uh, regarding the first question about the differences between the king, right, and the Khmer, the ethnic minorities, Farmers in Sopchang. Yes, um, 
in Sokchang, yes, indeed, the Khmer um, farmers actually account for a large percentage of, of farmers. And I did interview some Khmer uh, farmers, but my first, um, I would say my intention was not to, like the purpose of this study was not to compare the differences between two ethnic minority groups between the Khmer and the King. But um, based on my observations, sorry, because this is a qualitative study, so I don't have, uh, you know, large uh, data sets to confirm my observation. But I do see that the ethnic minority farmers like Khmer, they have less connection with the local authorities and also less access to, to climate and um, agricultural advisories. And, um, and so they rely more on peer farmers experience and exchange information with other farmers to, to make decisions. And actually when I did some usability tests with the Khmer farmer to show them the agroclimatic bulletins and see how they interacted with the bulletins on their phone. Some of them show how to say very like high interest into this bulletin because it's the first time that they saw this kind of bulletins. They don't they are not so they were not so familiar with external advisory services before. So but um, please, um, this, this is based on my observation and um, I cannot generalize this with, um, with um, large um, quantitative uh, data. Yeah. And regarding the second question on um, the um, human central design approach, how is this compared to other, like, I would say neighborhood approaches like participatory approaches. Actually, this is a common question that I have received from some um, participants, some people. I would say it's more like a com complementary approach to some uh, like similar approaches like participatory approach or system thinking. It's um, the only difference here, I would say, is that the focus of human central design is more on the, the human, on the users. Are we going to design something that users want to use? Is this really something that they want to use and fit to their context? And uh, But it doesn't mean that we only focus on the human. Uh, because another aspect of human central design is that we need to think about other aspects like the business aspect and also in terms of the feasibility of the technologies. So we start with a human and we come up with solution to meet their needs, but it doesn't mean that we let them write the wish list and, uh, and do everything to, to satisfy their needs because we are under constraints, we under time, we under technologies or resource constraints. We, uh, in reality, uh, we don't work alone, we work with partners. So we need to think about stakeholder engagement. We need to interact with other uh, stakeholders to deliver, uh, to create and deliver the service. So I would say the strength of human central design is that it's really focused on the humans, on the users at the beginning, but it's not like one like a perfect solution, a perfect approach. You need to think about uh, those aspects. You need to consider uh, different approaches as well. Right. Thank you very much. But, uh, Lam, in relation to this, and, uh, um, you know, my question is, you know, in, in your presentation, um, you know, so that, you know, there are diverse needs, preferences of, of uh, you know, uh, the different actors about this information. So, how tough is this to prioritize uh, uh, this, uh, you know, prioritize which features is important, you know, um, probably in this week compared to the next week? How actually you decide that what kinds of information or features, uh, you know, will be important for a, you know, for one period because there are diverse need one uh, from the farmer maybe they have one kind of need from the market actors who are working in the market they have uh, with agricultural products they have different needs so how do you prioritize really about these different people's need in the system 
Uh, I think it's a very va valid um, like question. It's a very good question that I would need to further discuss with the team to see how we can prioritize the farmer needs <laughs> and, and preferences. Uh, but I, based on my understanding, I think uh, first we need to choose the target groups whether we want to focus on one's personas, one user groups, or we want to ensure the um, inclusivity of the service. So in do by doing so, we like ideally for a climate service, we should have some features that serve the needs of, um, you know, most of the users, most of the um, target users. But we also have some features to specifically addressing the needs of some uh, users group. For example, um, if we want to attract the innovative farmers, then we, need, we should not just provide general advisories. We should have some more uh, ne like new information, new tips, more innovative farming techniques, because that's what the, um, the innovative farmer needs. However, for the small scale uh, farmer who have limited um, ability to act upon information received, we need to ensure that this, um, this advisory that we provide are actually are practical and, and it's advisory that they can act upon. And so, um, Again, I think it's a big question, it's a very good question, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I would need to further discuss with the team because it's more like about our strategic approach, how we yeah. can, you know, addressing the needs of each user group, but at the same time, we ensure the wider reach of the, of the service. Okay, 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 thank you. Uh, okay. I think Opichong is the next. Opichong, can you please ask your question? We have only 10 minutes. Thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. As far as I know, the ABC uh, uh, have been developed for any year uh, already. Uh, so, so far, if then is study to estimate the uh, percentage or the quantity of the rice production or apply. Uh, sorry, I don't quite uh, get the question because I cannot hear you clearly. Can you put the, the question into the chat box? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, also same to me. I also didn't hear properly about yeah. the question. Uh, so, uh, Pichong, uh, Pichong, can you please, uh, you know, inform to chat? Uh, 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 Dr. Saladin is the next. Saladin, why you are muted? Uh, my question yeah. is, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, in all this kind of uh, research uh, is done under project support, right? And then when we want to sustain the system, we need to think about the commercialization so that it is sustainable. Uh, it continues after the project is completed. Uh, so did you consider that how this could be, you know, like generate revenue and so that it could be sustained in the system without any project support? Like people will uh, pay for their services and then it will be automatically, you know, uh, Self-sufficient. Self-service. Did, did you consider that in your research or? Uh, 
Okay, so the question um, is about the sustainability of the service, right? Yes. Okay, yes. Um, actually, it's not the, it was not the focus of this uh, study. And because this study mainly focused on understand user needs and preferences and the context in which they access climate service and climate information. Um, but I think in the following steps, if we really want to ensure the sustainability of um, our service, we need to consider other um, aspects of um, human-centered design. I didn't put in the slide, but um, there's one diagram that showed different aspects of human-centered design. It starts with the human, but after that, after we have a good understanding of family user needs and preferences, then the next stage is to take into account the viabilities of the business and also the feasibility of the technologies. So, yeah, in, indeed, in the future, we do need to to consider um, others' um, business and technologies aspect to really create impact. So, but within the scope of my study, um, you know, for when, whether they are ready to pay for the services, uh -huh. if it is good. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is a um, question that a lot of us wants to know, but it's uh, yeah. uh, not the focus of, of my study because I'm just uh, focused on on the needs and the preferences rather than the willingness to pay. Yeah, this is actually a very important issue. I know, you know, Lem, um, uh, that you are, uh, your study is an ongoing study. Uh, so, but, you know, this question is very important because whenever we are facing, you know, we are coming with this kinds of new technologies, the next question, what people are asking, and it's a, it's a, you know, valid question that what's the sustainability, you know, is it sustainable after the project? So I, I think I, uh, that focus group discussion or that uh, the kinds of discussion you are organizing, please also, you know, uh, try to, you know, raise this issue so that you at least can give some indication in your study about it. Mm, yes, uh, thanks to you I, for the suggestions. Yeah, I see Opi Chong already uh, heard what he wanted to ask. How many percentages of farmite applied ABC in the context of the province? Can you, or in the context of the local locality? Can you please mention it? Um, actually, I I don't have this figure because it's um, the study that I that we conducted was a qualitative study. So I looked into like their experiences, their um, you know, their behaviors rather than like looking at the percentages of how many people applied. But I can search for the results of some a survey that we did before and share with you the percentage. Oh, I, I saw that my colleagues, one of my colleagues has shared the figures on the percentages of people applying the ACB. So I hope that they're, yeah, they have provided sufficient information. Oh, there's a, there's a good um, number. Jahan, of... Yeah. I just want to to um, inform you that there's also a question from Mariana, related question, okay. but you might have missed it. What's the question? So this is um. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, you mentioned that the sharing of info through the government could also be disadvantage. Did you use how how this is, or is it just the way or how it is currently shared? Finally, could mm -hmm. you see any tendencies already whether the bulletin is helpful for farmers? Are they happy with it and base decisions on it? What decisions in particular? Uh, mm -hmm. And um, how do you see the bulletin as a straight information sharing in comparison to learning through collaboration? For instance, the use of bulletin could be a basis for debate in farmer groups. Will you explore this way of using the bulletin too? So that that mm -hmm. that was her question. Thank you for the reminder. Yes. So um, 
In terms of the first question is about the sharing of the bulletin through uh, government partners through extension offices. So in the two provinces where, uh, where we conducted the study, um, the extension offices created um, group chats on Zalo, on like similar to WhatsApp, to share the information. So they collected their farmers' phone numbers and they added the farmers to those Zalo group chat. And um, during the seasons, um, every ten days, they share the bulletins through this um, in this group group chat, and that is the way that is being shared. Uh, how um, and and also that uh, like each district has um, one Zalo group for sharing the informations, but then uh, the members or the users uh, in those in this Zalo group also share the bulletin to other farmers in their networks. So um, so that's why we have some some farmer who have direct access to the ACB, but we also have some farmer who have indirect access to the service. And um, so I hope that I address a question on how the bulletin is being shared. Um, yeah, so in terms of the value of the bulletins on how the or how the bulletin has been helpful to farmers. So based on my uh, the user's interview that I conducted, the farmer like the most added value or um, like the value of these bulletins is that it provides a downscale district level weather forecast to farmer. Because normally there's just access, um, you know, general weather forecast on TV, and um, they also value the best and disease advisories and following each um, stage of the crop development of the crop row. So um, mostly when they receive advisories on pest and disease management, they um, say that they when uh, they could vi visit the field, they can check their field more thoroughly, more carefully because they receive the the advisories on pest and disease alert and and about and management. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And let me check the last question. How do you see the bulletin as a strict information sharing in comparison to learning through collaboration? For instance, for instance, the use of the bulletin could be a bias for debate in farmer groups. Um, actually, for my uh, for the, our study, I didn't really like look at the group sharing of information. I mostly focus on the individual farmers. But I do think that collective information sharing and collective decision making among rice farmers in the Mekong River Delta is an important, important matter to focus and, and to take into account. Because um, when they make collective decision, then um, even though they receive the information, but sometimes they cannot act on the information that are, that's they receive individually, they need to discuss with other farmers in the group to, to make decisions. So uh, yes, in reality, the bulletin could be a bias for debate for farmer groups, but I could not, uh, I cannot verify that because this is not a question that I aim to answer in, my, in our study. Thank you, Lam. And I actually do not see any more question. Um, and it's almost uh, you know it's two minutes over. So uh, thank you, Lam, for your uh, study or for the great presentation. Um, and thanks to all the participants today for your valuable insights. I think you know with this uh, collaborative effort and. Uh, people can write to you if they have any suggestions. So this is also open, um, and the presentation will be shared uh, with the um, uh, audience soon. So with this, I would like to thank all and want to end and um, close uh, the uh, Dela Talk 11 presentations for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay.